Yeah. So, your, your own needs, it's very personal. Okay. In uh, about two years ago, I was, uh, I went with my family on a fishing trip and we, we you know, I haven't really fished a whole lot uh, before and this was kind of a bit of a novel uh, experience. Uh, I had gone the previous year uh, with my son and two, and, and two years ago I took my whole family and we went on this fishing trip and uh, uh, on, the, on the Kaveri River in a place called Dodamakli which is about uh, 180 kilometers from Bangalore. Okay. And what the fishermen do is they take you out on this river in these coracle boats, right? Boats that look like this. And you're out there for three or four hours and, uh, and you're, uh, uh, you know, in the middle of this beautiful setting and you're waiting for fish to kind of leap into your boat, right? Which is what most fishermen hope they do. And I was out with this fisherman, and, uh, you know, a couple of years ago and he said, sir, I've seen you before. And I said, uh, yeah, I, I came here a year ago. And he said, you know, I remember you've come here a year ago. He said, give me one second, you know, and all this was in, uh, in Canada, and, uh, uh, and he pulled out his Nokia mobile phone, okay, which was wrapped in a plastic cover. And then he pulled out from another plastic cover that was in his pocket a 1 GB memory stick. Okay, he opened his phone, popped in a 1 GB memory stick, and then thumbed through it and found a photograph that he had taken of me the previous year having caught a fish. Okay? I just thought this was the most surreal experience. Here we are out on the water and, and the fisherman, you know, guy in shorts, you know, who spends all his life out on, the, out on the water, pulled out a photograph of me from the previous year. Okay? And I thought, whatever Nokia had imagined, or whatever the makers of that memory stick had imagined, this was not a use case they had imagined. Right? There was no use case in their conceptualization of the problem that said a rural fisherman in India is carrying around his entire life history of albums in his pocket on a 1 GB stick, which is what he was doing, he, because he couldn't leave it at home. It was too precious. Right? So he's carrying around a 1 GB stick in a, in a plastic bag. And so I came away from that thinking, oh my God, what is the opportunity to repackage this experience for you know, the million such people for whom capturing moments with their family are incredibly important, right? And, and what's the packaging of the solution for that? Because it certainly was not the intended use case. Okay? So that's where ideas come from, right? It comes from daily interactions that you have with people. If you only stop to say, oh my God, that's amazing. Right? You could just as easily have had this experience and said, oh, that's really interesting, that's fine. You know, I could barely see the photograph and moved on. But on the back side of it is a is an idea. Now, whether you choose to do something about it or not, step one is, can you recognize a gap that exists? Okay. And the gap is, there is a use that things are being put to that was not kind of originally conceptualized. And this you see everywhere. Once you start looking for it, you see it everywhere. And if you don't look for it, you see nothing. So one of the first things I'd encourage everyone who is interested in entrepreneurship is to start looking at the world with a little bit of wonderment, right? Cynicism doesn't help. For you to be able to say, oh, that's just a really unusual thing. That's really interesting, right? And allow yourself to be inspired a little bit by it and see what is interesting about it. File it away. You don't have to do anything about it. In fact, most entrepreneurs have kind of a slightly childlike quality in this regard. They tend to be amazed by a lot of things. Okay? And one of the important muscles that I would encourage you to cultivate or develop if you're interested in entrepreneurship 
is allow yourself to be amazed by things. Because it's just truly, it's truly interesting the number of, number of uh, the way you, way you start seeing the world and kind of the opportunities and the gaps uh, in the way uh, uh, things exist today, right? Because ultimately entrepreneurship is about being able to have some sort of impact on the world around you, okay? And to do so making money, but ultimately it's about having some sort of impact on the world around you. And the way you kind of see the world is an important uh, uh, attribute to that. And it doesn't need to come, you know, and it comes in all sorts of ways, okay? So on January 16th, uh, this year, this little news clip, I, I left for Europe in, uh, 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 on January 16th, and Chennai had this news item. On January 8th, the minimum temperature was 22.7 degrees Celsius, and on Tuesday it was 19.1 degrees, two degrees below normal. Okay? And I, I love the next sentence, which was, a mist set in at 5 a.m. and it was really cold, I had to wear an extra t-shirt. So this is cold, cold in Chennai, right? So I landed two days later in Helsinki. Okay? And on the vertical axis is degrees in Celsius, right? And it, it is minus, okay? So you're not... And I landed January 19th at about 8 o'clock in the morning, okay, in Helsinki. The red line across there is the temperature to which my freezer in my refrigerator at home is set. So coming out into Helsinki at that temperature is like a mind-altering experience. You know, tears come into your eyes the instant you feel that cold air and it crystallizes on your eyelashes so you can't close your eyes. It's my, uh, minus 23 degrees, so I, I, and there's no wind, it was calm, it was just brutally cold. Okay. So, you can either, now, you know, this is like the most amazing thing, right? To go into Northern Europe, 60 degrees latitude, on the coldest day they've had in the last, you know, uh, something like 48 months or uh, uh, 60 months or something like that, and to experience that is really something. Okay, and one of the things that I saw, right, is that, you know, I'm sitting in the hotel lobby in my hotel, you know, wondering if I dare to kind of go out because if you spend 15 minutes outside without the proper protection, you can actually uh, get hypothermic and you can, you know, you can, you can actually collapse. So, so you need to be really well protected to go out in, the, in those temperatures. And, and you look around Helsinki, life is going on like normal. Okay, because... They, you know, this, this is a people who have lived there for thousands of years and have learned how to cope with this, cope with this, right? With this cold and intense cold. And when you look at how life has adapted to this cold, it's really fabulous. So one of the things that, uh, uh, you know, when I was sitting in the lobby of the hotel is you see people come back in from outside and they've got six layers, right? And all these kind of new, uh, new technology jackets that, that kind of has, uh, that allows you to keep warmth in and so on. And there was a family sitting next to me in the hotel lobby. Uh, and there was a huge squabble going on because they had just come down from their rooms and the child who was maybe six years old wanted to go to the bathroom. It takes 30 minutes, 25 minutes to dress a child in all the layers of clothes that are needed in order to brave the cold of Helsinki. And, and I saw the parents roll their eyes and one of them took the child and went back upstairs. And I sat there thinking, nobody's invented clothes in Helsinki that are easy on, easy off in extreme cold, right? No one has. So the idea, and, and perhaps no one there, you know, so you just immediately assume that people there must have thought about it. But if you look around, you find constantly gaps between the way people need to live and the way people want to live versus 
the way stuff works just because it's always worked that way. Okay, so it doesn't have to be in your immediate setting, you know, in Chennai and where, in where uh, you've grown up and things you're comfortable with. If you start looking at the world as gaps between what people want or what people need to want versus what they have, you see it everywhere. Okay, and, I'm, and later that afternoon, and I'm going to show this as a completely gratuitous picture, I braved and I went out from my hotel room and 15 minutes around the corner at minus 20 degrees at 3.40 in the afternoon is Helsinki Cathedral, one of the most amazing sites with sunset on it. I'm showing it to you gratuitously. It has nothing to do with my talk. Okay. So. Uh, why did I go to Helsinki in January in the first place? Uh, uh, because a customer took me there. Right? So. So uh, we have we have an important customer who's uh, based in Helsinki, and I and I uh, and I was uh, I was there as part of uh, you know you, when when you're an entrepreneur and when you're in business you don't pick and choose uh, where you want to go and what you want to do you kind of go where the where the money is and you go uh, and do what it takes for uh, the business to be successful. Having said that, however, I will tell you that when I was in Helsinki, uh, uh, several of my customer the folks I was meeting with at the customer were somewhat apologetic because they said, you know, you should come back to Helsinki in the summer. It's so beautiful. And I, and I, and I genuinely said to them that, uh, you know, every European city is beautiful in the summer. But to see Helsinki in the winter is truly a remarkable thing because that really, you know, it's a different kind of beauty. It's really, it really is quite spectacular. Uh, so there's ideas. Right? So ideas come from everywhere. Ideas come from around you, in your world, based on your experience. But you've got to figure out how to identify the idea when it occurs. Because you can see that family and the clothes and not have the idea. And the only way you will have the idea is if you look for it. Okay? And part of being an entrepreneur is to generate so many ideas that you don't know what to do with it. You've got to generate lots of ideas. You've got to be generating an idea a day. When I, was, when I was in college, I would be writing down on slips of paper ideas for things. They could be big things, they could be small things, they could be stupid things. But I was writing them down all the time. And, and I think if you talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, they'll tell you that they've been doing this for a long time in their life. So, th so the idea around which they started their company is not the first idea they had. Just like the cliff that Alex climbed when he climbed uh, Half Dome was not the first cliff he climbed. You've got to have done it a thousand times. Okay. But when you have the ideas, there's a set of disciplines around what you do with the idea to progress it. Okay. And there are concepts in, 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 in company uh, R&D departments and innovation uh, departments called the idea funnel. Okay? And in a big company, it tends to be a little bit bureaucratic, but there's some really important constructs around it, which is important for, as, as muscle groups for each of us to build. There's idea generation, and then what do you do with the idea once it actually occurs to you? Right? Is a set of muscle groups around what I would call de-risking the idea. Okay. So let me just talk about risk. Uh, if, if I've got a stream in front of me and I've got a small narrow plank of wood to cross that stream, if that wood is one foot above the stream, I'll cross it. If that same plank of wood was raised 100 feet above the stream, exactly the same plank of wood and exactly the same walking skills, I might think twice about crossing it. And if it was 1,000 feet above the stream, I probably would not cross it. 